and recognize not just conceptually, but really experientially that we are part of an interconnected universe, that we are part of a web, that every moment is a confluence of conditions coming together and coming apart. It's like for a few moments now, if you could just reflect on bringing to mind anybody who has had any role in your being here in this room right now. Because no one, I am sure, was driving down that road and saw a sign that said Panther Kill Road and said, I'm going to go in there. Right? We're all here because of conversations we've had and interactions and Somebody gave us a book or read us a poem or told us about this place or told us about their practice. Or There's so many beings, in a way, represented here in this moment. Each of us is like that conduit for all these relationships. So this moment in time is all these relationships coming together and then shifting, and then changing. That's a, a part of reality. It's not fanciful, or it's not like wishful thinking, or anything like that. It's actually the way things are. That our lives have something to do with one another. It's just the nature of things. That's wisdom. That's insight. As Bob was saying yesterday, it doesn't mean you disappear, you know, or that uh, there's some part of you that's been your friend, your companion, that's been showing you a good time, and then it's gone. Um, we just see more clearly. Oh, look at that. It's like there's a way of looking at a tree and seeing it as a tree. It's just standing there, right? It's a thing. It's a, it's a seemingly solid entity. There's another way of looking at the tree and understanding the influence of the nature of the soil, which is nourishing it, and everything that affects the quality of that soil, and like the rainfall, and everything that affects the quality of that rainfall, which we now know is, is pretty vast. So you look at the tree, and you also see that it's part of a network of relationships. That's also the tree. So that's interconnection. It's interconnection is emptiness, actually. Not that there is no tree, not that you can't look at it in the old way, oh, it's just a tree standing there, but we can also look at it in a, another, it's like another dimension of what's true and often overlooked. Look at that, all those connections. That's the nature of things. So that's mindfulness leading to insight about change, about emptiness, about who we are, about what brings us happiness, what brings us sorrow. And then the last is compassion. I talked yesterday about self-compassion. Every time we let go and begin again, we're really practicing some self-compassion. And it's also a, a compassionate sense toward others. To some extent, the compassion is a kind of inevitable result from seeing more clearly. If we really felt ourselves to be part of this network, part of this whole, we would respond differently to one another. The creation of the other would be quite different. And it's also, certainly within the Buddhist framework, it is very possible to train these qualities to actually cultivate loving kindness, cultivate compassion. I know that sounds weird and it sounds cold and kind of mechanistic. Like I went to Menla Mountain Retreat Center and I came out compassionate, you know, or I got my certificate in compassion, but. Um, the belief is that something like loving kindness or compassion, uh, these are emergent qualities of how we pay attention. 
You know what it's like if you're talking to somebody and you're not really listening to them and you're thinking about the email you need to write or something, and then you just listen and you're really there and you have a whole other sense of connection with them just from actually being there instead of being so distracted. It's a little bit like that. Or maybe we hold a very strong fixed view about ourselves or others and we manage to drop it for a moment and really listen. How we pay attention, what we pay attention to, really creates the ground that loving kindness and compassion can emerge from. And so here too, it's an attention training. I don't know how many of you have seen one of the um, most fun things I've ever done, uh, which I really only did in some minor way was um, this site called Happify.com made an animation of me telling a story, which I'm about to tell you. And uh, for some reason, every character in the animation is a dog. So you get to see me as a dog. And it's so cute. It's like this dog's mouth moves and my voice comes out telling the story about training compassion. So I highly recommend the animation. Uh, They've just done one with Dan Harris, who's a mouse. And I believe I'm a cat in the next one. I'm not totally sure. And they're all on my website, too. But um, this is the story. I was talking about, um, uh, I, have, I live in Massachusetts, but I have had, over the years, various sublets in, in New York City. And uh, there was one time I was living in a certain neighborhood. and. Uh, I had a friend who's a writer who also lived in that neighborhood, and I was reading a manuscript of his. And in the manuscript, he talked about frequently going into the corner grocery store there and very commonly seeing the same person, the same woman working behind the counter. And he said that he realized that even though he goes in there so frequently, he really had very little sense of her, except maybe a very vague kind of fleeting sense that maybe she wasn't that happy or she was a little bit grim or something like that. But mostly it was just indifference, you know, really kind of oblivious to her. And he was so shocked at seeing that in himself that what he wrote was that for all I recognize she was a living, breathing human being who wanted to be happy just as I do, she might as well have been a cash register with arms. And so he decided, okay, I'm going to go into the store and I'm going to pay complete attention to her. So he did that. He went into the store and the first thing he noticed was that she was singing along to something on the radio and that she had a really beautiful voice. So he said to her, wow, you have a really beautiful voice. And she just lit up and she gave him this big radiant smile. So I was reading that in his manuscript, and I thought, wow, I go into that store all the time, too. I don't really pay any attention to her either, pretty much, except this very vague sense that she's not that happy. So I thought, OK. Can't really go into the store and say, I read you have a really beautiful voice, because it's like <laughs> completely bizarro. But I can go in there and say, I heard you have a really beautiful voice. So I thought that could be normal conversation, right? So. That I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, I heard you have a really beautiful voice. I'm going to watch her light up. And she's just going to get so happy. <laughs> so I went into the store. And the first thing I noticed was she was already lit up. She looked perfectly happy. And I thought, oh, kind of that's too bad. Like, <laughs> and I realized how much of her I likely missed all those days. I went in there not really looking at her. So when we actually pay attention to somebody, it is the conduit for a very natural sense of connection to arise. And we'll keep exploring loving kindness and compassion throughout our, our time here.